Hi, I'm Eliza Byers, an adolescent gynecologist at Children's Hospital Colorado. And over the next 10 minutes, I'd like to give you a quick overview and update on PCOS in teens. So what is PCOS? It is a metabolic syndrome that is caused by a combination of genetic and lifestyle or environmental factors. Despite its name, it is not caused by cysts on the ovaries, and it actually affects many body systems. As you all know, when we eat food, our stomach turns that food into sugars. Our pancreas then secretes insulin to store that energy in our muscles, fat cells, and other body tissues. When someone has PCOS, they also have insulin resistance, which means there are higher levels of insulin circulating in their body. This might be due to genetics or their environment, and usually it's a combination of both. Now the ovaries of someone with PCOS are exquisitely sensitive to insulin, and because of this, they do not properly perform one of their normal functions, which is to ovulate, usually about each month. This is one of the necessary diagnostic criteria of PCOS in teens, what we call ovulatory dysfunction, and it manifests as amenorrhea, abnormal uterine bleeding, and other forms of irregular and chaotic menses. Insulin levels are also responsible for the other necessary diagnostic criteria of PCOS in teens, what is called hyperandrogenism. This is caused by excess of androgens, specifically testosterone, being made by the ovary, and lower levels of sex hormone binding globulin made by the liver. Most of the testosterone in the body is bound to sex hormone binding globulin, but when there is less of this protein around, there are higher levels of free or unbound testosterone, which then acts on target tissues. So many patients with PCOS may have severe cystic acne and or hirsutism. Another skin concern that often develops is acanthosis, or darkening of the skin in the neck folds and other places, and this is caused by these higher levels of insulin. The cycle shown here is reinforcing and without intervention continues to promote weight gain, fatty liver, and the development of type 2 diabetes. Depression, anxiety, and sleep problems are also related to PCOS and continue to feed into this cycle of hyperinsulinemia. So where to start with making the diagnosis of PCOS? The answer in teens is always the menstrual history. After the first menstrual year, causes of abnormal menstrual cycles other than immaturity of the HBO axis need to be considered. Bleeding more often than every three weeks, going longer than two to three months without a period, and bleeding longer than seven days are all indications of anovulation. There are many causes of anovulation to consider, so a careful history is needed to cover these, but PCOS is one of the most common. Clinical signs of hyperandrogenism come next. I do an exam to look for these, but it's important to ask if they've already received treatment and also if they remove hair regularly. Along with the social history, I ask about activity and their approach to lifestyle. How do they feel about these currently? As I'm sure you are aware, obese teens and families have usually been told many times that they need to lose weight. This statement alone is rarely helpful and at times hurtful to a teen who is struggling with body image or who is constantly fighting a battle with their parents about what they should be doing. Using an approach that is based on motivational interviewing is a great place to start with gathering this information. Indeed, most teens with PCOS do have abnormal weight gain, and so it's important to discuss, but consider offering information about insulin resistance how their bodies are very good and even too good at storing energy. Genetic factors, of course, play an important role in all of this, and so asking about a family history of PCOS, gestational diabetes, and type 2 diabetes, along with other metabolic conditions, is helpful in assessing a teen's risk for PCOS and other health issues moving forward. Lab testing is the next step and is necessary to confirm a diagnosis of PCOS in teens. Other causes of ovulatory dysfunction, such as pregnancy, thyroid problems, hyperprolactinemia, and ovarian insufficiency need to be excluded. 
Looking for hyperandrogenism is a bit more complex because sensitive tests for testosterone are not well standardized in the female population. At Children's, we obtain a total and calculated free, not direct free, testosterone on all patients that we see who we are evaluating for PCOS. You will know it is the correct and sensitive test because it also includes a resulted value for sex hormone binding globulin. In a patient who has PCOS, we expect their calculated free testosterone to be above the normal range. And this is mostly because their sex hormone binding globulin level is low. Total testosterone in the setting of PCOS may be normal or slightly elevated. Other tests that are needed if a patient has clinical signs of hyperandrogenism include a 17-hydroxyprogesterone and a DHEAS. For patients who do not have clinical hyperandrogenism, the ultra-sensitive calculated free testosterone test is especially important because otherwise the diagnosis of PCOS is likely to be missed. Although not part of making the diagnosis, all teens with PCOS, even those who are normal weight, should have metabolic screening labs. Early detection of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and prediabetes can lead to targeted interventions and prevention. Teens with PCOS also need screening questions for sleep apnea and mood disorders as they have much higher rates of both conditions than their non-PCOS peers. So to summarize, the diagnosis of PCOS in teens requires two things. The first is ovulatory dysfunction and the second is hyperandrogenism. Criteria to make the diagnosis are more rigid than in the adult population because for all teens, puberty can be a time of hormonal and metabolic instability. For patients where you can't make the diagnosis but you still suspect it, we use a category called at risk for PCOS. For example, we find that over a third of the patients that we treat with acute abnormal uterine bleeding during that first menstrual year end up being diagnosed with PCOS later on. We also see lots of patients using hormonal therapy or birth control to manage their irregular periods and acne, but they did not have formal PCOS testing before starting. Patients really need to be off hormonal therapy for three months before doing accurate hormonal labs, and this long break in treatment is rarely desired or clinically indicated. Using the at-risk category can be helpful in these and other scenarios. This is a great time for me to make sure that you are aware of the most recent consensus guidelines on PCOS. These are available online and free to everyone. They offer much practical guidance for providers, including simple algorithms for diagnosis as I've just described. One other item that I wanna highlight from the guidelines is that pelvic ultrasound is not used to diagnose PCOS in teens. In fact, this cystic appearance is considered normal until at least eight years following menarche. The guidelines also recommend a holistic approach to treatment, which we're gonna to touch on now. This is a slide from a presentation that we do for new patients that are coming to our multidisciplinary clinic for PCOS. The idea is that treatments should be connected and patient-centered. Lifestyle changes are absolutely first line, but the focus needs to be on specific and achievable goals that can work for the patient and their family. Understanding what PCOS is about and how it affects the entire body is key. As you can tell, we try not to focus on absolute weight gain or loss, but it is important to know that for most patients, even just a five to 10% reduction in weight results in improved PCOS symptoms. And of course, treatment for depression, anxiety, and sleep problems have an incredible and positive impact on everything. When it comes to medications, almost all teens need some type of hormonal therapy to keep the lining of the uterus thin, healthy, and protected from endometrial hyperplasia that occurs in the setting of anovulation. There are many options available, from a 10-day course of Provera every three months to long-acting options like an implant or levonorgestrel IUD. Combined hormonal methods like the pill, patch, and ring are often a first choice because they have the added advantage of also helping with acne and hirsutism. 
we often recommend metformin for teens who have metabolic issues, and especially those who have continued weight gain despite lifestyle counseling. Because it reduces insulin levels, metformin can help with acanthosis and the entire cycle caused by hyperinsulinemia. Metformin also causes more frequent ovulation, and so sexually active teens need to be aware of this and offered an effective method of birth control. So thanks for listening to this update on PCOS in teens. I want to acknowledge our pediatric endocrinology partners at Children's Hospital Colorado, who we work with closely and are also an amazing resource for providers and patients on this topic. Thanks again, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us.